So here's the deal. I think the way most people go about photo engraving, including myself at the beginning, is just to go on Google or YouTube and look around and see what other people are using for their settings. The problem with that is if you just do that, then you're probably going to end up with results that look something like this. And this can actually be a really frustrating approach because sometimes you'll just do trial and error. You might get something that looks better, but at other times you might try something new and it might actually give you worse results than where you started. So this past week I decided, man, I just got to figure this photo engraving thing out. And so I did hours and hours of research and I came up with a list of seven steps that all seemed to boil down to. And only after sort of lining these steps up so that I could do a sequence of tests, did I actually run anything on my laser. And honestly, I was really surprised by how good it came out literally on my first try. This is what it looked like. And I should also mention that this was all done without using Borax on the wood and without using any photo editing software like Photoshop or anything like that outside of the tools directly in Lightburn. So in this video, I'm just gonna take you through the seven steps that I used in order to get to this result. And hopefully we'll learn something along the way. So let's get started. Step number one is to start with a good photo. What's that old adage, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? You've maybe heard that, but basically the idea is if you start with a blurry or poorly lit photo, when you engrave it, it's gonna look even worse. But if you just need a good photo to practice with, you can actually do what I did and just go online to a free stock photography site like Pexels, which is where I found this Husky photo that I'm using here. And even if you want to practice with the exact photo that I'm using in my series of tests here, I'll leave a link in a, a photographer credit in the description of this video so you can go and find this exact photo from Pexels if you want to. Step number two is just to choose the material that you're going to engrave on. And this is really important for three main reasons. First, it will determine the size that you need the image to be within Lightburn. Number two, this will determine whether or not your photo needs to be inverted. And long story short, if you're doing a black engrave on a light surface, similar to what I'm doing here with my black engrave of the Husky on my light colored wood, then you do not need to invert the image. However, if you're doing something like a white engrave on something like black slate, then you do need to invert the image. And I'm not using this invert setting here on these tests, but if you wanna know where it is, you just go to the layer where you have your image on, you open up that layer by double clicking on it, and then you can see this little option that says negative image. I believe that is the checkbox that you're gonna to use to invert it, though I haven't really used it here myself. And reason number three, the material you choose will significantly impact the final look of your engraving. For example, if you choose something like metal, it's going to tend to engrave more accurately than engraving on something like wood because organic materials tend to engrave a little bit less consistently. And if you compare within different categories of wood even, you'll get different results based on color differences and changes in the grain patterns and even things like the moisture and resin content of the wood. If you're curious, the wood that I used for this series of tests is actually Baltic birch plywood. And I used this mostly just because I had extra sheets of it lying around, but I'm sure there are other materials that we could have used that probably would have made this Husky look even better on the final engraving. With those preliminary details out of the way, it's time to get into the first of a sequence of several tests. Step number three is to get the power and speed settings for the engraving. Fundamentally, a photo engraving is really just another type of engraving. And so you're going to need to dial in your speed and power settings just like you would mostly for any other type of engraving that you're gonna do on your laser. I ran a test for this using the built-in power and speed material test generator within Lightburn. And because I want this to be a fairly dark engrave so that the details of the image pop, I chose one of the darker options. And what I went with here is a setting of 3000 millimeters per minute and 20% power. Do keep in mind that this is specific to my blazer and my material. So your results may vary and you might need different settings. If you struggle with this sort of a test grid, then don't worry, I actually made a pretty in-depth deep dive into how to create, use, and read these sort of test grids. So at the end of this video, I'll put a little clickable card up at the end where you can just click to it and watch that also if you need to. The next step is to run an interval or DPI test. This was probably the hardest part of the entire process for me to figure out. And so I gotta give a huge shout out to the Laser Everything YouTube channel because they have a really in-depth uh, guide video online that covers the more technical aspects of photo engraving. And so I'll make sure to put a link to their video on this topic in the description below. Thanks to you guys if in the off chance that you see this. Um, but anyway, the interval test is something that is really important for how we dial this in and what your end photo is actually going to look like. So I'm gonna do my best to boil down the basics of what you actually need to know about the interval test right here. So first of all, DPI and interval are connected. So if the interval goes up, then the DPI goes down and vice versa. And what we're going to mainly deal with is the interval. And all the interval really is, is just the space between the different lines that make up your engraving. 
And to get the perfect photo engraving, what we want is lines with an interval such that each subsequent line that are, that are basically next to each other are just barely touching, right? And we don't want there to be a lot of space between them. That would be an interval that's too high. And we don't want there to be too little space between them. That'd be interval too low. And that would cause the lines to actually overlap, which gives us a, a blown out image is what people would call it. And Lightburn actually has a built-in interval test generator that we can use in order to find that perfect interval line spacing for our project. To find that interval test tool, what you want to do is go up to your menu and select on uh, uh, laser tools. That's what we're looking for. And then within laser tools, there's a button called interval test. And so I'm just going to click on that and it brings up this dialog box. And there's a few different options here. Uh, the easy ones are speed and power. So these are the things that we got already. So I believe I chose 3,000 millimeters per minute and 20% for the speed. Steps is just the number of squares that you want to test or the number of different intervals that you want to test. Um, so I think I'm going to, for this one, what did I have? I had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different ones that I had here. So I'll put that in. That's what I used. And then for minimal uh, min interval and max interval, this is really the only tricky part that you have to figure out here. So basically, uh, if you think about it logically, the space to between, between the lines and thus the interval is going to be really close to the same as the dot size of your laser, because the dot size determines the thickness of that line, right? And so uh, basically, what I wanted to do here is I just looked up the dot size of my laser. And here I'm using a, an Xtool D1 Pro 10 watt, which has a dot size between 0 0.06 and 0 0.08 uh, millimeters. And so I just went a little bit below that range and a little bit above it so that if there's any variation between uh, my dot size and the actual interval that's going to give me the best results, I can identify it using, using this test. So I know that sounds like pretty complicated, um, but basically the long and short of it is I just found the dot size of my laser. And then for the minimum, I put it a little bit below. So I went 0.04 because that's a little bit below 0.06, which is the beginning uh, range of my dot size. And then I went a little bit above the 0.08 of my dot size uh, to 0.1. And so that's what I use for my minimum and maximum interval. And then for, uh, um, the, the last two things that you need here is just the size. That's just the, the size of the block. And I, I didn't, I think I just left that to the default, which was 15 millimeters here. And then the very last thing is simple fill versus dithered image. So let's talk about that for a second. So for my test, I used simple fill because I think that it's easier to actually see and, and read the test results because the lines are more clear in my opinion, um, instead of dithered image. When we actually do the engraving, it's going to be a dithered image. Um, but for dialing in my settings, I use the simple fill. And as far as I can tell, it's okay to do that and sort of make the translation. Um, but if you know otherwise, do correct me in the comments. I'm happy to learn uh, about that. So let's move on. So here now is a close up of my interval test that has burned on my, my birch here. And as you can see, it's just got the, the amount of my interval, the 0 0.06 and so on. And what I did here is I just basically did an eye test to see, OK, what looks like the most consistent lines here where I'm not seeing like space in between the lines, but also it doesn't look like there's um, significant dark spots where the lines are, are overlapping. And you got to be careful because there are also grains in the wood. So you might see something that looks like a dark spot, like here in this 0 0.08, but it might just have to do with the makeup of the wood. And so you kind of got to take a close look at this. I did it for my testing just with an eye test. However, you can also get a little magnifying glass um, like this. This is called a, a loop, I believe. And that's basically just a, a little magnifier that you can use to look more closely at those lines to see if they're touching, overlapping, or if there's space in between them so that you can find, OK, which of these options is actually the best interval for what I'm going to do. All right, so far, all we've used for our tests is the built-in test generators within Lightburn. But now I'm going to use sort of an optional step to do some homemade tests in Lightburn as sort of secondary tests to make sure that I have the right settings for power and speed and also interval. And I'm going to call this step 4.5 because I see it as kind of optional. Um, I did both of these tests and I ended up only really changing anything with the second one. So let me just quickly show you what this is. So here you can see I have something labeled second interval test. And if you look closely here, basically what you can see is I have interval settings of 0 0.078, 0 0.08, 0 0.082. And so basically I've just taken the best from my interval test that I did a moment ago 
and just went slightly below it and slightly above it. And then instead of just using the built-in generator, I actually put this on a little cutout of my actual Husky photo. And so I think this is a good idea in theory, but I ended up just sort of confirming my results that 0 0.08 looked the best to me. So I didn't change anything here. And the other secondary test that I did, which you can see right here labeled second power speed test, is to see whether or not, now that I've sort of dialed things in a little bit, and once I put a photo into the grid, whether I thought I needed to actually change the power and speed at all. And after doing this, I did decide that I wanted to actually increase the power a little bit. So I went from 3000 millimeters per minute and 20%, which was my original setting, and I increased it to 30%. So 3000 millimeters per minute on 30% power, and that's what I'm gonna use for my subsequent steps. And let me just quickly mention, if this seems kind of like wild to you doing this sort of like custom test grids with the photos and whatnot, I actually covered how to make a test similar to this on a video I recently did deep diving into, into how to create, use, and read uh, test grids. And so don't worry, I'm gonna leave uh, that, that link again at the end of this video if you wanna see sort of more detailed steps for how to accomplish something like this grid. All right, and the fun continues with step number five, which is figuring out the dot width correction. So second to the interval that we just kind of figured out with our previous testing, I think the dot width correction is probably the second most important thing for getting a good looking image engraved. And dot width correction sounds pretty wild, but it's actually fairly simple. And there's a really good visual explanation of what it is and how it works on the Lightburn forum that I found. So I'm just going to quickly show you what that looks like on screen so you can see that and I'll link to this thread in the description if you want to read it for yourself. Okay, here we are on the Lightburn forum and basically what they're explaining here is that when you have an image that's like a digital image, what it's doing is it's creating the image with a series of lines like this first image here uh, that I'm going over with my mouse. But the problem is that when you use a laser, you don't get a rectangular or like a square line. What you actually get is something circular. And so if you tell your laser to engrave this sort of straight rectangular line, what you actually get is like circular edges on the sides, like this second image here. And so the purpose of dot width correction, um, as they, they explain here, is to actually change the size of the line such that the outside edges of the, the circles end on the squares where you want them to. So you can see on this grid, if you look at the fine light grid here, like line here, line here, they've changed the size or the length of this line with that width, width correction such that the outside circular parts are now inside the grid, whereas originally without changing anything, it would be outside the grid. So that's sort of the science of how it works. Now let me show you the custom test grid that I made in Lightburn in order to actually test what dot width correction I want for my photo engraving. Now here in Lightburn, you can see that I made this uh, another <laughs> custom dot width adjustment or correction test. And basically what you can do is you, you cannot have a dot width correction that is higher than your interval. So as you'll remember from earlier, our interval here is 0 0.08. Um, so we can do anywhere from zero dot width correction all the way up to 100%, which would be 0 0.08. And so I sort of am testing the middle of the range here. And uh, the reason I decided to go in the middle somewhere is actually, again, because of that uh, laser everything video that I watched and linked to in the description. They talked about doing 60% as a good ballpark for dot width correction. But I wanted to test it myself and see what results would work best for me. So I tested everything from 30% of my interval all the way up to 70%. And if we look over here on my, my wood test here, uh, you can see the differences and I also had a, a none or a no dot with correction as a control at the bottom right here. Um, and so you can see after doing all this test, I thought it was pretty clear that a dot with correction of 50%, which translate to uh, 0 0.04 because 50% times my interval, which is 0 0.08, gives us 0 0.04. I thought that was by far the best looking result. And so that's what I'm going to use for my dot with correction here. And I just realized I forgot to show you where this dot width correction setting is. And so let me just quickly show you that. If you go into a uh, light burn and you select, uh, you select your image, then you, you look at the layer that that image is on and you double click it, that will open the cut settings editor. And then if you go down toward a, uh, to the middle of the page, you'll see dot width correction. Um, by default, this is usually off. So you have to turn that toggle on and then put in the value of, of your interval. And so 50% for me, uh, for this one is 0 0.04, so that's what I've entered here in this box. And as a quick side note, you can see the, the line interval here on the screen as well. 
All right, now step number six is to figure out the proper image mode to use. Now, if you've done any research already about photo engraving, you might have seen different image modes mentioned, like Jarvis, uh, Dither, Stucky. These are some of the popular ones. And so I did some research on this, and the ones that seemed most likely to have a good result for this sort of engraving were as follows. They were uh, Dither, Stucky, Jarvis, and Grayscale. And so I made another little custom test grid here that had each of those. Now I should mention that all of these have the exact same settings from our previous tests. So they have the same power and speed, they have the same uh, interval and the same dot width correction. The only thing that's changing between them is the different image mode. And that will sort of allow us to do an apples to apples comparison of what image mode looks best for this particular test. And after I ran this on my laser, I had a look at things and I, I saw, first of all, that the grayscale didn't look very good. As I understand it, grayscale can look good, but you really have to carefully dial things in to make it look uh, nice. And that can take a lot of work. But just with the results I got here, I thought the one that looked nicest was the dither. So that's what I'm going to use for my final step. All right, now it's time for step number seven, the moment of truth, which is to run the full final engraving using the things that we got from the previous steps. So just to quickly recap on some of the things that we've got from our test so far, we're gonna be using the power and speed we got earlier. We're gonna be using the interval, the dot width correction, and the image mode that we've determined with our previous testing. And we're going to apply all of that to this final photo engraving. Now let's take a close look at our final result. Here on the right hand side, you can see the results of all of our tests that we just did sort of applied to one image with a full engrave. And on the right hand side, we have something like what I probably would have gotten if I was just doing the research and guesswork trial and error sort of approach. But if you look at the left hand side, I think it turned out really nice. And you can even see some of the detail of the little hairs. I'm not sure how well it shows up on video, but I think this looks really nice. And, and so much so that I would be pretty happy using these settings if I was using the same laser and same material for actually making a product to send to customers. But in order to get a result like this, I really had to dial things in and I did a series of those uh, custom tests that I showed you. So to be able to do this, you really have to understand how to make your own custom test grids. Uh, but don't worry, as I mentioned, I made a full video about that and I'm going to put a link to it right over here. So if you wanna learn all about how to create your own test grid, how to use them and how to read them, then go watch that video. I think it's gonna help you out a lot. So I'll see you over there, see you next time.